Good evening. Welcome to the Tuesday, May 11th, 2021 Planning Commission meeting. And uh, we'll start with a roll call, please. You're muted. Sorry, sorry about that. Yeah, here we go. <coughs> Commissioner Metcalf? Here. Commissioner Bundy? Here. Commissioner Chase? Here. Commissioner Bendel? Here. And Commissioner Rizzo? Here. That's great. Okay, we're all here. Thank you. Um, now is the time that if you have a public comment, we open the meeting to public comment for something that is not on tonight's agenda. Um, your opportunity to comment later on the agenda items will arise with those items. So if you have something you'd like to speak to that's not on tonight's agenda, you have three minutes to do so. Um, Tracy, do we have anyone offering to do that? Excuse me, I was muted. Um, we do have a open tonight also the, the Q&A feature where you can type your question if you prefer. Um, I don't see any hands raised. Um, I know open questions have been added to the Q&A. Um, no, no emails uh, either, Chair Chase. Okay, thank you very much. All right. Then we'll go ahead and we'll just close the uh, public comment section of tonight's agenda. And we'll move directly to the new hearings. So tonight uh, we have two items on a new hearing and a business item. So 303 Corte Madera Town Center, Carbon Health Signs. This is a sign permit application for two illuminated signs for Carbon Health at 303 Corte Madera Town Center. Tracy, this has your name on it. All righty. Thank you, Chair Chase. I'm going to just share my screens. I have a short slide presentation for you. Okay. Hope you can see that. Yes. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Chair Chase and Vice Chair and Metcalf and Commissioners. Um, the proposed project at 303 Corner Madera Town Center consists of two new illuminated signs for carbon health uh, at, at the tenant space. Tenant space. Um, it has been our practice in the past to bring these highly visible signs such as Just Food for Dogs, Rite Aid, Il for Nio, and now this particular application to the Planning Commission um, for review. The project site is located at the south end of the Puerto Madero Town Center Mall, uh, north of Camel Pius Drive in the mall parking lot. Um, to the south of the project site, um, approximately 390 feet away, um, are other commercial businesses zone C3 Highway Commercial. Um, and to the west, um, approximately 500 feet away is the Madera Gardens neighborhood within the R1 medium density residential zone. The property, um, um, subject property is zone C2 regional shopping. Um, and as explained in the staff report, uh, there's an existing use permit uh, for the town center for medical dental uses with a cap um, on square feet. And with this project um, falls under the cap for medical dental. Um, the main entry doors to the tenant space are oriented west um, towards the town center south courtyard. And pedestrian access is provided by a stairs at the front entry and an accessible ramp along the south elevation. The south elevation, uh, south facing elevation of the tenant space um, includes two large display windows um, with gray awnings. No changes are proposed to the exterior of the building um, other than the new signs for carbon health. Um, the tenant improvement is currently under review and requires only a building permit. Um, the applicant proposes two new illuminated wall signs comprised of the Carbon Health logo and wordmark. The signs are proposed above the main entry door facing west and above the accessible ramp uh, facing south southwest um, towards the parking lot. The signs are 7.31 square feet and 7.28 square feet in area for a combined total of 14.6 square feet of sign area. Um, both signs will use a white channel lettering for the word mark combined with a multicolored dot logo and each letter and the dot, the individual dots are individually mounted to the beam and the wall. 
the sign over the main entry door will be uh, face lit or internally lit with LEDs and the sign on the wall above the accessible ramp will be lit internally as well as al along with um, halo illumination and halo illumination is where the light behind the sign shines on onto the wall behind the sign for a, a halo effect um, and signage will be installed um, using with uh, dimmers and timers as required with condition of approval number six uh, and seven um, related to to lighting and the previous signs for Umpqua Bank at this uh, tenant space were awning signs um, and window signs, as well as signage on the ATM, uh, which has been removed. Um, and those signs were not illuminated. Um, along the south part of the town center, signs for uh, Chase Bank, T-Mobile, Ethan Allen, Phil's, and at and are all illuminated. Um, and then the Flores sign um, is painted onto the building and is lit um, from above, both, both signs are lit from above. Staff is able to make all design review findings, which you'll find in attachment two to the staff report, resolution 21-006. Um, staff is recommending approval, and I'm here to answer any questions. Um, we have the sign fabricator um, also on the call, if you have questions specific to the um, lighting or design more installation of the sign. Thank you, Tracy. Um, I'm going to reach out to the commissioners right now and see if any of the commissioners have any questions for you or for staff, anyone else, uh, starting with Commissioner uh, Vandell. Do you have any questions? Yeah, Tracy, would you repeat the uh, businesses that already have illuminated signs? Excuse me. So, thank you. So, the um, tenants um, have that have illuminated sign along the southern elevation of the mall are Chase Bank, um, T-Mobile, Ethan Allen, Phils, and at &T. And I do have um, some photos of those signs if the commission would like to take a look at those. Thank you. Any other questions, Margaret? No, not now. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Mr. Rizzo. Do you have any questions? Yeah, I just have a general question, maybe maybe for Adam. Um, uh, just regarding uh, when a uh, when a a property's got a specific plan and, and it meets all the findings. Um, I was just curious why it it actually came to the planning commission if it if it kind of met all the guidelines and goals of you know sort of our one of our older meetings where we talked about the objective design standards. Um, why this actually comes to commission if it does meet it's it's not something that's out of the ordinary like we're going to review the charging later on um just curious about when you do have a specific plan and it meets all the guidelines and findings um is it in our general plan that everything comes to uh, yeah. planning commission uh not necessarily and, and maybe actually tracy's probably more well oh, sorry tracy I, that's fine you mean I'll, I'll let, um, no, no, that's fine i I'll let Tracy answer just sure, and sure. I can fill in. Um, as some of you might be aware, and it sounds like Jim is, that there's tenant design guidelines is what the mall refers to mm -hmm. uh, this document as, and and it includes parameters for signage um, that their architects and mall management review with all these signs and um, whether it's building permit or, or planning design review. Um, and those guidelines have been updated um, in I think it's 2018 and that the commission has not reviewed those. Um, and so, you know, probably their next update, that will be a good idea for Monty to bring those to you for review and approval. And then these types of signs would be exempt at that point, given if they do meet the uh, design guidelines and the town sign ordinance. Um, but for now, in trying to be more conservative, uh, we feel that these highly visible signs should, should be reviewed um, by the commission until such time as we have a document that you all have. Um, had a chance to, to look at and, and bless. And, I'll, yeah. just, uh, oh, and I'll, just sort of, I'll just add to that also, um, Jim, given I've done a lot of science for both town center and the village. It was established quite a while back. I think when Adam and I kind of began, you know, five, seven, five, six years ago, the understanding that, that you know, signs that are visible from the parking lots or from roadways 
mm-hmm. in either of the centers, either of the shopping centers, um, go to the planning commission. Um, and so that's kind of the, the, the guideline that we've been using in the past um, many years. And the, majority, and the majority of signs that the commission sees are in associated with you know, t- uh, tenant improvements, mm-hmm. you know, exterior changes like Flores restaurant. So you saw, or the planning commission saw the entire Flores restaurant, which was a major change to that whole facade. And with that was the sign. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's very, you know, not that, that many like this where the building isn't changing, only the sign's changing. I will say though that um, I think it should be a goal of ours uh, as we move forward that we do have the, both the town center and the village. And the village, we have approved sort of these master sign programs in the past. Um, the last ones that were approved did, as Phil said, they, they sort of had a planning commission level review for the exterior facing ones. But, but in the future, if we can get to a point where, in fact, we do have these master sign programs come before the planning commission for approval, uh, that's a much more streamlined way of dealing with these signs so that we can actually uh, streamline the approval process for things such as this if they meet all of the standards that the commission mm-hmm. has approved in those guidelines. So I, I do think that's, you know, um, as we get more experience and comfortable with what are adequate standards, we can start to develop those and just mm-hmm. have a sort of a, a a, a master uh, approval, if you wish, as long as those signs meet those standards. So good question. Yeah. All right, thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, anything else, Mr. Rizzo? Uh, no, thank you very much. Okay, uh, Dr. Bundy, uh, do you have any questions? Uh, no questions. All right, and Vice Chair Metka? No questions. Okay, so <clears throat> fairly streamlined. Um, does anyone want to make a presentation for the applicant? I'm here to answer any questions, but I think Tracy covered pretty much all the aspects of the signage. Okay. Um, good to know. Uh, I think it's pretty clear. Um, I'm going to open this up for public comment uh, at this point. So if there's somebody out there that would like to uh, email in to public comment at uh, gcmmail.org um, or raise your hand on Zoom. Do we have either of those occurring? Uh, uh, th- thanks, judges. Um, I don't see any raised hands. And you can also utilize the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen if you prefer to type the question. Um, and I, I don't have any emails um, at public comment at PCML. OK. All right, well, we'll consider a uh, low public comment on this item. So we will close the public comment on this and we'll bring it back to the uh, commissioners for a discussion. Who would like to start out with their thoughts on this? Margaret, perhaps. <laughs> um, I don't really have any ob- objection to it. I, I'm, what is carbon health? Just out of curiosity. Um, they're nationwide. Um, they provide primary care and urgent care, as well as virtual care in their brick and mortar locations um, throughout the nation. Um, they also have some testing uh, capabilities that they um, uh, limited uh, that they do. So, are there going to be doctors on site? Is that it? Um, doctors and clinicians um, and um, physicians assistants, um, and obviously other support staff. That was just out of curiosity. Um, and, and just one other, um, I'm assuming the sign is just going to be a stable sign, the illumination part of it. It's not flashing or anything like that. Is that is it's that, correct? It's, it's correct. not, doesn't flash. It's uh, illuminated uh, using LED lights uh, inside and one sign uh, behind. Yeah. Okay. I don't have any uh, other comments. I, I have no objection to it. All right. Very good. Um, Mr. Rizzo, do you have any uh, comments on this? You're, you're muted, sir. I, I, I don't have any objections uh, to the sign, and I don't have any more questions. Thank you. Right. Thank you very much. 
Dr. Vundy, your thoughts. I, I want to congratulate Carbon Health on not trying to tear out the existing facade and creating something totally new. I think it all looks very appropriate. Very good. Uh, Phyllis, your thoughts. Uh, I can make the findings, and when you're ready, I'll be more than happy to make a motion. Uh, agreed, and I have no commentary on it, so it's all acceptable. Uh, please make a motion. Okay. In the matter of sign permit application number PL-2021-0034 for two illuminated signs for Carbon Health at 303 Corte Madera Town Center, resolution 21006, I urge a yes vote. I'll second. Okay. <clears throat> right, I will call the vote. Um, starting with uh, Commissioner Bundy. Yes. Uh, Commissioner Rizzo. Yes. Commissioner Bandel. Yes. Vice Chair Metcalf. Yes. And Chairman Chase. Yes, of course. And Great. Do we need to read the uh, appeal rights here? Just in case it doesn't. Action by the Planning Commission at a public hearing or meeting any decision of the Planning Commission may be appealed to the town council within 10 calendar days and those forms are available on our website um, or at the planning department at town hall at $300 filing fee um, is required. Thank you, that's great. Okay, 10 days, new sign. All right, next on our agenda tonight is a business item. This is preliminary. This is 100 Corte Madera Town Center. This is called a Volta Charging Station Signage Discussion. Preliminary review of a proposal for six Volta electric vehicle charging stations, two of which will be media stations in the southern parking lot of the Corte Madera Town Center. All right, Mr. Boyle, yours to present, please. Thank you. Good evening, Chairman Jason, members of the Planning Commission. Uh, yes, this is a preliminary review that probably don't have that that often. Um, this is a preliminary review, obviously, for a commercial project. And this is a proposal to install six Volta electric charging stations, two of which will be what they what they call media stations, where there are there are a charging box that contains a um, a video screen on either side and then the, the charging cords attached to them. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> excuse me, two of the six will be media stations and the other four will be basically just posts with, um, with the cord attached. Um, these will be located on the Southern parking lot, the same area we were just talking about, um, across from Chase Bank and across from T-Mobile. And um, again, this is a preliminary review. Um, staff and the applicant are asking for the planning commission to uh, receive this information and um, um, discuss it and give feedback regarding uh, issues in terms of policy, planning, design, um, so the applicant can make any, any applicant and staff can make any adjustments if um, this project comes to the commission um, for a formal review. Um, this project is um, overlaps or isn't um, appropriate to the um, Corte Madera Municipal Code, of course, in terms of signs. Um, the town center is in the special purpose overlay district. So in that, for that reason, we are dealing with precise plans. And also I mentioned in the staff report, we have the, the town EV charging ordinance, um, which streamlines EV charging and also specifically mentions uh, EV chargers, EV charging stations that have signs that relate to something different than just telling a person, here's a place to charge your car, need to go through this process. Um, so that's relevant as well, um, that, that, um, that EV charging ordinance. And then lastly, as Tracy mentioned, the, the town center design guidelines. So that's just a brief overview. And again, no, no formal action is requested of the planning commission this evening. And with that, I will turn it over to the applicant, um, Scott Altman, from Volta charging or from Volta. Yeah, Volta, Volta charging, Volta is easier. 
Um, hey everyone, um, is it okay if I if I share my screen? Yeah. Okay. Um, before I do so, I just you know first of all I want to say thank you for everybody's time uh, here today. I've been working with Monty for maybe a year, year and a half on on this project, um, and we finally were able to come to an agreement sometime last year, and have just been going through the design process of of uh, getting these uh, chargers uh, fitted for that location. Um, so let me let me share my screen. And if, if people can't see it, let me know. Let's see. All right, can everybody see that? Yes. Yes. Okay, perfect. All right. Okay, so I'm gonna hit play here. Oh, that's odd. Let me see here. It's doing a weird sharing the wrong screen. I'm going to try this one more time. Okay. All right. Can everybody see the oh. presentation? Yes. Yeah. All right. It says Volta, right? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Right, right. right forward. Yes. Okay. Great. Um, so again, I'm, I'm Scott Oldman. I run uh, Volta site development for Northern California. Um, also on the call is Bryn and Leslie from our legal team, as well as Carrie and Spencer from uh, our one of our engineering partners. So um, if there are some more technical questions, they they're more more able to, to answer those. Now, of course, I'm going to be respectful of everyone's time. So I'm going to limit this presentation to about five minutes. Um, and I'll leave five minutes for Q&A. However, if at any point there are any questions while I'm presenting, uh, please feel free to, uh, to jump in. Um, with that, if it's okay with everyone, I'd like to, uh, like to get started. Please do. Okay. So we were founded in 2010 um, with the mission to further accelerate EV adoption. Um, our founder, his name is Scott Mercer, took kind of a, a really unique approach by combining storefront advertising and electric vehicle charging. Now, as a result, we've built the most utilized EV charging stations in the United States. Um, offering sponsored charging to drivers where they like to be. Uh, so far, we've given away almost 100 million sponsored miles, uh, offset over 42 million pounds of CO2, saving roughly, I think the equivalent to that is about 3.5 million gallons of gas and you know, obviously counting. Now, as you can see in this photo, our stations double as an ad platform, um, or you can kind of think of it as a messaging network. Uh, which are deployed at high foot traffic locations like the town center or like the village, um, engaging new audiences and telling high impact stories using this sustainable technology. Now, the messaging capability is core to our business model uh, and is built into each of our stations, as you can see here, uh, which allows us to serve not only local and national businesses, but also community messages like the ones you see here. Um, the one in the middle um, uh, is, is one that we've been running. I'm not sure if it's still running now, but we ran through uh, most of last year on all of our stations as a way to um, help those locations, um, you know, remind folks that are, that are there to you know, social distance and, and avoid that kind of contact. Uh, we also work with local nonprofits to put up uh, their advertising and their messaging as well. Um, but this is what allows us to um, operate as a business because we're able to generate revenue from the ad display or their sponsorships uh, from brands like the one you see on the right, Polestar. So what does the most utilized EV charging network mean? Well, it means that each station across the US gets on average of about five and a half charging sessions per port per day. Each charging session have, has an average duration of about an hour and a half, offsetting about 20,000 pounds of CO2 each year. Now, in California, these numbers are obviously higher, specifically in the Bay Area, where electric vehicle concentration is the highest in the U.S. So it's no secret that more electric vehicle chargers are needed 
in order to help meet current and future uh, EV charging demands. In fact, uh, there are over 33,000 plug-in vehicles within a 15-mile radius of the, the location you see here. If looking at just Corte Madera, there's roughly one in 12 vehicles that have a plug for charging, whether that's level two charging or whether that's uh, DC fast charging. Now in Corte Madera to date, we only have one location, which is at the, the, the village or the town village. Um, and that location has four chargers in front of the Macy's there. Um, these chargers have given away over 500,000 sponsored miles to your constituents and uh, visitors to that location. So what do our site partners get in return? So, you know, working with uh, the town center at Corte Madero, you know, whether we're partnering directly with a REIT um, or a retailer or even a municipality, for example, the city of Richmond is one of our, one of our site partners that we work with. Um, we provide an end-to-end -end turnkey service from site evaluation um, and permitting to engineering, installation, and final inspection. Now, once the stations are turned on, we continue to operate, maintain, and service the stations at no cost to our site partner. In fact, our field team regularly services the stations to keep them online and in perfect condition. Uh, in addition to that, we of course provide 24 seven uh, driver customer support. So. I'll stop there. I know that's kind of a lot of information, but just wanted to give a high level overview of, um, of what Volta is and what we do and what our business model is and how we partner with folks. Um, now, specifically for the town center, uh, Corte Madera, as uh, Phil said, there are six charging stations. Um, two of them are media enabled or sponsorship enabled, as you can you know, saw in the photos here. Um, those are the DC fast chargers. And then the other four are level two charging. And the idea is that we want to provide chargers that are accessible to any plug-in vehicle that's out there, whether they can use um, DC fast charging and a level two or just a level two charger. Um, it's also chosen that way to match the shopping behavior um, of folks going to that location. So. Uh, if they're just going to the Phil's Coffee right there um, or a quick run into T-Mobile, then a DC fast charger uh, better matches that, um, that shopping behavior. Uh, the level two charging is a better match for folks who are uh, looking to stay a little bit longer, shop a little longer, and incentivizes to shop a little bit longer because the level two charging is provided um, at no cost to the, to the end user. Um, so that's with the town center Corner Madero. So I'll stop there and see what questions folks might have. Well, I will start that process with the commissioners and see if they have any questions for you. Um, are you going to have more to present after this? Uh, I just have examples of, um, of the actual layout of the charging stations, where they're going to be, um, all the, the specifications for them. And I also have examples of the types of sponsorships that um, go on the stations if, if folks would like to look at that. Yeah, certainly important. Um, I'll start with you, Mr. Rizzo. Do you have any uh, questions for this gentleman? Um, I have a few questions. Um, uh, the first being, I, 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 when I, I, I gave you guys an email earlier this week um, and uh, you had answered my questions about some of the cut sheets uh, with the L2 chargers uh, being a, a dual a dual charging um, pedestal. And then there's there's another uh, thing called the super stick that's between the two uh, video panels. Is is that a um, a seventh charging? Yeah, that's um, a good question. Yeah, thanks for thanks for bringing that up. Um, that was actually a uh, a misprint. So there were a couple of things that need to be updated on it. So okay. what you'll see is the DC fast charger has the 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 charging port coming directly out of that uh, media charger the two DC fast chargers that are media enabled. And then the level two chargers have the cords coming directly out of that charger. So there's no uh, quote unquote super stick. That was from an older design that just wasn't updated in that, in that drawing set. 
yeah, I was just, I, I just thought maybe it was something because you know, it, maybe if the other parking spaces were filled and someone couldn't use the DC that there was a seventh option. I was just curious. Yeah. Um, no, yeah. Thanks for, thanks for bringing that up. That's the, uh, that was the situation. So we'll get the, the new updated construction drawings to, to not, not have that included. And, and these are level three, the DC. The yeah, sorry. So there's there's different terms where yeah, level there's level two and level three. Level three is otherwise known as DC fast charging. Okay. Um, how was the the location selected within the mall? Curious. Um, yeah. I'm sure that you guys did some studies and. Yeah, we do a variety of different studies uh, and analysis looking at both where there's um, and. The most important one, at least for us, is looking at the uh, amount of traffic to yeah. the shopping center. So, um, because our business model is predicated on the on the sponsorships, it's really how many eyeballs are able to see that for folks that are you know walking by that area. Um, so that that was part of the reason. Other issues are like control issues within a specific lease agreement with the mall, where maybe we're not allowed to go in front of the Safeway, but we can go in front of you know where that T-Mobile sign is. Um, so there's a few different things that we look at, but from our perspective, uh, with our business model, it's, it's the mm -hmm. amount of traffic to, um, where there's highest foot traffic, which and, is usually up front, right? And you guys don't have a DC charger that doesn't have the graphics. It's just the ones with the graphics. Yeah, currently that's, yeah. And, and the graphics is, is really the only way that we're able to provide this amenity, uh, at no cost to the, to the site partner. Mm -hmm. Because the, the sponsorships pays for um, the the capex and the operating costs and so on. Yeah. Okay. And um, lastly, I don't know if this one's for Phil or if this is the appropriate time to ask Phil this question. Um, uh, Chair Chase. Sure. Go ahead. Yeah. Um, so um, I just had a question. I, I think that we were also talking about um, changing the the uh, precise plan a little bit to evaluate how much video content, I guess, because there's there's a video content aspect to this and maybe hours of operation. Is is that something that the mall is going to come back to us with? So, you know, we we could figure out how much how much we're going to allow in this area so it doesn't look like Tokyo. <laughs> well, it's yeah, it's so a, a precise plan. So I'll back up a little bit when um, with, with both malls, they were both developed. The, the first um, aspect of developing the malls was for the applicants to come in and create preliminary plans. Yeah. And so both malls had preliminary plans. They said, you know, the buildings are gonna be here, parking lots are gonna be there. We're gonna build, you know, a new road, that type of stuff, real big, you know, big picture type of stuff. So, so the malls, the preliminary plan was approved and then the applicant comes back and does a precise plan. Precise plan gets more specific, you know, this size building and variety of different things <laughs> and gets into much, gets into the details of, um, you know, design, um, design aspects of the buildings, sign aspects of the buildings, that type of thing. So that's, um, so those precise plans were, you know, approved long ago and they've been gradually modified over, over time. And um, when someone wants to put in a new building, when uh, Restoration Hardware dropped their building in the parking lot, that was a, a big, you know, precise plan mm -hmm. amendment. <laughs> so we we consider this a precise plan amendment because again, they're they're adding you know small accessory structures onto this site, and so if they were to move forward, like I say in the, in the staff report, you know, they would come in with an application that says we want to amend the precise plan, and our amendment of the size, precise plan is to install. You know, six mm -hmm. chargers at this location. Um, they're going to be, you know, two media stations. They're going to be on from hours X to, to Y, uh, that type of thing. Um, so that would be the, the next step if they chose to amend the precise plan. Yeah. So if, if I can just add quickly to that, just because the other thing the precise plan can do is because this is sort of a unique accessory mm -hmm. structure in that it is, um, signage as well i mean we would we would call this signage it doesn't meet our current zoning ordinance with respect to a sign uh in the middle of a parking lot because we actually all our signage regulations require signage to be either a monument sign as you mm -hmm. see at the town center sort of at the driveway entrance or on a building for example things like that 
However, the precise plan does allow um, you to modify the sign regulations to permit signage mm -hmm. in a location such as this if um, it's consistent with the, you know, the, the uh, preliminary plan and if findings related to design review um, are also made. So um, that's how you actually <laughs> could get to an approval here if mm -hmm. the, the commission thought this was an appropriate um, use of the parking lot space for. for yeah, this, I was, um, I was actually just, um, I know that we, there's a maximum square footage, you know, kind of a, and signage in general, uh, when you're, when you're kind of laying out signage, would, would you think that the proposal would come in like the mall would say, well, you know, there's going to be a certain amount of digital content available throughout the property because it is a different type of signage? Um, well, they could, I mean, that, that would be, that's an option for, for the town center. If they want to come in, if they want to come in with this applicant, you know, they're kind of Volta and the town center are kind of joint applicants in some regard. Mm -hmm. And so if they wanted to come in and Volta says, you know, we want six charging stations today, centers say, well, there may be Volta's coming in or more other companies coming in. We're going to ask for a total of 10 um you know today you know this month and six of them are going to be volta and we'll have four on reserve to be placed on the north end or you know they can kind of craft it however they want um i don't get the sense from the mall that they would go that route i have talked to monty stevens about this unfortunately he's not able to make it tonight um he didn't express any desire that the mall would be interested in a precise plan amendment that included more than these six Volta stations. Okay. Thank you very much. Awesome. I appreciate it. And uh, thank you, Scott, for your presentation. Yeah, of course. Are there, are there any other questions that are going to uh, sure. answer? I'm going whether... to run through the other commissioners here. And so, uh, Phyllis, you got your hand up. So we'll let you. Oh, yeah, I had some questions. Uh, most of them actually relate to process. I think Jim has pretty much covered some of the physical aspects. The advertising appears to be national, and um, I'm uncomfortable with that. I mean, if there's going to be advertising, and that you know, if that decision is made, why isn't it advertising the businesses within the center? There is the option to do. We do work with local businesses. It's not just uh, national brands. And uh, what would be the requirements for eligibility of these ads? I mean, what kind of control do you have over what is going to be appearing on those signs? I'm sorry, Phyllis. I don't know if that was on my end or your end, but um, cut out the last sort of few seconds. Oh. Apologies. Yeah, we're having, no, we're having problems tonight with the okay. technical <laughs> stuff. We've seen that all around. Cool. I'm saying what requirements they have, what parameters do you have? for companies that advertise? Um, I mean, I'll, I'll have to connect my 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 media sales team to, to get those exact parameters. But as far as like the process for how a local business would be able to advertise um, their product. And no, any business. I'm saying, you, oh, okay. I drove over to the village. I saw yeah. them. I saw the signs. I see the examples you've shown here. Now you've got to have some parameters. Uh, not everybody, right. not every business is what you want advertised on the sign in the shopping center. So I'm asking you, what are the parameters? What are the requirements in so, general? Yeah, no, that's a good question. So a, a couple of things. One is um, we have certain sponsorship restrictions where uh, there are certain, we, we really care more about what we're not going to be putting on there. So okay. nothing, you know, that is graphic, no weapons, no guns, no tobacco, stuff like that, right? Um, and then as far as like, if you were a business that went on site and you're like, oh, this looks like a good spot for me to advertise my, my dentist business. Uh, we have a couple uh, different ways to do that. One, we have a team dedicated at Volta that reaches out to local businesses. Um, and then we also have a platform um, that is available for folks to go on and, and purchase um, advertising space on the, on the stations. Um, what that cost is, is contingent on the market and it's contingent on a variety of different factors, but um, any local business, as long as it doesn't 
as long as it's not promoting guns or violence or something graphic, they could advertise their, their business on, on the stations on uh, local. I'm glad to hear those things are excluded. I, you mentioned that uh, you had been working with Monty for about a year. Yeah, maybe this longer. Together. Maybe. I'm trying to think of how to explain. What was taking a year? What, you know, why, what were you trying to work out? What were the, um, I'm trying to think of the right words to use. What did you need? What did the center need? that took a year to work out yeah. um a lot of times ev charging isn't always the main priority for a property owner especially a large shopping center um and then you have things like covid um, that hits that uh where there's other major things to to focus on um but at least the process in our end is you know we do this side evaluation and we actually have a um uh, analytical tool uh, that uses um, machine learning to determine how many charging stations and the types of charging stations that will help meet current and future demand. So there's a process there. And then really it's just, I, I think, you know, Monty, he's the property manager. He's not the right. property owner, right? So then you have to get ownership involved. And then I think he was also uh, considering other EV charging um, providers as well. And, and ultimately landed on Volta because of the you know, the value prop that we're able to, to provide. Um, I think probably one of the more important things that, um, that at least he really cares about that we also care about is making sure that the uh, charging stations that we provide are accessible to, um, to all uh, EV drivers and plug-in drivers. And as I'm sure some of you are aware of, you know, Tesla is only good for Tesla. Polestar, I think, uh, is doing a installation at the mall across the street, that's only for Polestar. Rivian is only for Rivian. Um, ours are available to um, to anybody, including, you know, Rivian, including Polestar. So it oh. doesn't quite answer your question. There's a variety of things that cause well, it. Well, no, I'm <laughs> just trying to work through this. And by the way, uh, the center going through many uh, uh, different steps is actually owned by a public employees union in Florida. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> when I found that out, I was like, what? <laughs> yep. What are they doing in California? Okay. Now, as you work through this process, is Monty the one who told you that it should come before the town planning department and planning commission, or is this something that Volta usually does? Uh, we, we try to have as much engagement with the city as possible, um, especially since they're the folks that are providing the permit. Uh, to do mm -hmm. these stations. The, the other reason behind it, um, and I don't know if it was first Monty or if it was first my permitting team, I, I don't know. Um, but at least from my perspective, uh, as I mentioned earlier, I, I work directly with uh, property owners, retailers, as well as municipalities. So from my perspective, you know, working with uh, local municipalities and helping them achieve their climate action plan goals, uh, which in Northern California, as I'm sure you guys are all aware, almost every city will have some sort of climate action plan or goal that incorporates EV charging. Uh, it's an opportunity to um, figure out how we can help support with those goals, even if we are partnering with the property owner or the retailer. Okay, well, what Mr. I'm working Moore. towards wow. is how long have you had the uh, charging stations up at the village? Oh, I think that was your project, correct? That was years before I joined Volta. I joined Volta in 2019. I believe those were in 2016. Or 2000. The ones with the advertising. Mm -hmm. Yeah, those are level two charging stations. Okay. Yeah. And they did not go through a planning process. As far as I know, they didn't go through a permit process either. Uh, I'm not sure. Um, my Bryn, who's on my legal team, uh, she probably has a lot more information about that. Um, if I don't know who has control over muting or unmuting, but I'm sure she'd be more we than can, We, we can speak to that too, Phyllis. Yeah, let's let the staff read. Okay, well, no, the reason I'm bringing up is, uh, ironically, we went through ethics training today that the state requires. And uh, I think part of ethics is treating people fairly, everyone fairly, and you're going through this whole process and as far as I know, Stan Hoffman did not go through this process at the village. And I'm trying to figure out what, why, and how. 
Mm -hmm. Mr. Boyle, would you care to address this if you yeah. may? Sure. I can I can speak to that. Uh, yes, the you know, the Volta charging stations that are located are actually on Macy's project properties. So they're on, on Macy's. So it would be you know in basically Macy's is the property owner. Um, mm -hmm. They did not go through a planning process. They did not come to you, this planning commission. Um, they appeared all, all of a sudden, basically, and we saw that they were there. And um, that's that is the history of how those Volta those Volta charging stations appeared in front of Macy's. There and no uh, to back back to your earlier question, Phyllis, of why these folks are here before you now is I've been I've been talking with them for for several weeks and talking back and forth and explaining to them that this is a very unusual um, application. You're dealing with signs. You're dealing with a variety of different things, and so we've we've collaborated and we've spoken about it quite a bit. And I recommended to them that they come before you as a prelim um, again to for the exact purposes of why we do prelims to flush out um, large or unusual um, projects, which I consider this an unusual project. Oh, I concur, and I'm glad they are coming before us. Uh, just to clarify something, there are none on the village property, just on the Macy's property. I know Macy's owns that building and that land. Correct. So they're yes. the ones that did not get the permit or do any of what they should have. That's correct. Okay, I think that about takes care of the questions I had because Jim asked all the other ones. Very good. Thank you, Phyllis. Uh, Margaret, do you have any questions for the applicant. Um, some of them have, have been taken care of. Um, and, but I'd like to go a little further into who control the control of the content of the advertisements. Um, who can, uh, what kind of other than um, people who want to advertise a business there, say a politician wanted to advertise there or Facebook wanted to advertise there. Do you have um, rules? Are there regulations? Are there statutes that control the content uh, or religion? Is there some kind of religious organization? Uh, yeah. what, what about things like that? Yeah, things like, uh, and, and Bryn, um, she's, she's on the call here, um, can speak more to, to that aspect of it. But yeah, I, I, from my understanding, we're not gonna put anything that's, that's religious on there. Um, I don't believe we'll put a political figure on there that, you know, like a politician that's, you know, running for office or anything like that. Um, we stay away from that. The majority of our um, advertisements are, and I'm, if you'd like, I can, I can share my screen one more time and show you a few, few examples. Well, I, I, I'm more concerned about, it sounds like it's a very soft kind of regulation you have there. We do do this. We don't do this. Are there actual um, something actually written, or yeah. how do you enforce that? It, it's in it's in the contract. It's in the agreement that we have with uh, with the site partner. With and partner. with with who with who the with property the, owner the property owner. So it would be within the control of the town center as to what the content was of what the content can't be. Yeah, cannot be. Okay. Yeah, cannot be. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Anything outside of that is is you know what we use to uh, monetize the charging stations to help pay back the the capital investment and the operating costs. Mm -hmm. um, it's primarily I think our our biggest ones are uh, Chevy that wants to advertise their new electric vehicles, Polestar, um, uh, some consumer packaged good companies. When we're in front of Whole Foods, um, that they want to advertise their product that's sold in that store. Um, those are the types of things that are typically um, up on the screen. And when it goes up on the screen, does the screen change? Is it flashing? Is it, uh, what's the level of lighting there? And is there any noise that comes out of it? Music, talking? No, no, no music, uh, no talk. It's not like what you see at a gas station uh, when you pull up and it's, you know, video, uh, long videos and commercials and stuff like that. Um, it follows all of the uh, national regulations uh, for, I believe, driver safety um, within, you know, a parking lot. Uh, they are set at each side is dual sided and each screen will have eight interstitials um, that rotates once every eight seconds. And there, there's 
still frames that are on the um, that are on the charging stations. On the on the less on the media, on the screen, right? On the yeah. So the so let me understand this. The screen is changing, or the screen is stable. The screen is stable. It, it's like a like a TV screen that's like vertical. Right. But the picture changes constantly. Once uh, at most, uh, once every eight seconds. Okay, and is that depending on how much is being paid for the advertisement? Yep. So sometimes, if we only have um, a couple people that are advertising, you might see those. You'll see those once every sixty-four seconds, each one, and then the rest of it might uh, will be like a, a message from Volta that says, you know, uh, free EV charging here or EV charging here or something like that. And what's the, what's the ratio that you use for like the public service announcements as opposed to uh, the paying ads? Like uh, the COVID, how, how often was that compared to Chevy advertisements? It, it depends on per station and what that uh, campaign cycle is for, for Chevy. But I know that we, and again, Bryn can correct me if I'm wrong, if, she's, if she can be unmuted, uh, but we ran not just um, not just COVID uh, sponsorship messaging, but also um, get out and vote messaging as well. And you can we put QR codes up on it, so people can actually go up to the screen and use the QR code, and it brings it to their cell phone if they scan it um, to show them where they can register to vote. And um, maybe, how do you decide those public, what I'm calling public service announcements? Uh, that happens internally at Volta. Um, we do work with some cities uh, to uh, determine certain types of messaging that we might want to partner with the city on uh, to have displayed there. Uh, we did a partnership with the city of Huntington Beach to display uh, emergency messaging. Uh, so, you know, God forbid, a, you know, um, a active shooter or a hurricane or some, something that's going on, um, then we could display messaging in these areas where there's high foot traffic where people can see, you know, what's happening or an amber alert or something like that. I think the what sparked that for the city of Huntington Beach was they were posting all these COVID signs on in these you know paper signs on the backs of stapled to you know a wooden sign and it rains once and they have to go back out there and they have to change it. But if you have it on these digital signs in front of a grocery store at a shopping mall where people spend their time and go to, they can see that messaging and that's you know that's a that's an advantage for for the city to communicate with um, with their constituents. And, and does Volta, your company, have uh, competitors that are going to come in and say, now we need to put up our stations because Volta had the opportunity to do their stations? Uh, we typically happily coexist with other EV charging providers because our business model is so different. Um, all other EV charging providers and that I'm aware of, um, their main business model is um, charging per electron, kind of like a gas station, they're charging for that fuel or some sort of, they're charging the property owner a service fee or something like that. And we don't charge the property owner a service fee. Um, so we, we exist with other EV charging providers. Um, and in my personal opinion, not speaking on the behalf of Volta, um, I think the more EV chargers we have, the better because it incentivizes people to, to go electric. So, so this is a question you may or may not <laughs> like but but what's in it for the town of Corte Madera? Well as you saw in the presentation uh, one in 12 um, I, uh, I have a, a plug-in right so I think any revenue or anything from it um, does the does do the constituents get revenue do does the town does anything go into the town uh, I mean what's in it for us other yeah. than if the the benefit to have more electric cars on the road? Yeah, outside of, you know, providing an amenity for, you know, your constituents or visitors to attract more people to that location and, you know, spend more money at the, at the shopping center. Um, there, there isn't a direct uh, active revenue that goes to, to the town unless, um, and I'd be happy to have this conversation uh, offline, but uh, unless uh, the town of Cormadera was interested in partnering with with Volta uh, to see how we might be able to look at some of this uh, the town owned um, areas and see if we're able to provide some free 
electric vehicle chargers uh, specifically for the town of Corte Madera. In that way, there could be um, you know, active revenue uh, given, to, given to the town. That I would be really interested in. <laughs> and we also pay uh, business taxes as well. Okay. Yeah. Um, okay, that's, that's it for now. I might have some more later. Yeah, please. Right. Those are great questions. Thank you. Uh, do you want to bring Bryn in for any reason at this point? To, if, does she have anything? She yeah, wants? I think she's on mute now. And I, Bryn, I don't know if you can say no or you, if you had anything else to add, you can add to that. No, I was just unmuted. Thank you. Um, appreciate it. Um, nope, Scott's, Scott's done a great <laughs> job. So <laughs> he's, he's, everything he's said is correct. Thanks, Brian. All right. Everything he said is true. Oh, no. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, Can you expand a little more on the uh, kind of regulating you do as far as content of sure, your yeah. commitments go? Yep. Um, yeah. So as Scott mentioned, uh, obviously we have a contract with the site owner and there are um, restrictions in there as to content that cannot be shown. Um, so as, as he said, you know, nothing of a pornographic nature or violence or anything along those lines. Um, it's obviously, you know, within uh, the best interests of the, of the site um, that and also for Volta as well, in terms of our, our brand, um, we certainly don't want to be in a position where any of the content that goes up on the screens is offensive um, to anyone. So we, we control what media gets shown. Um, and if something comes across our desk, uh, uh, across the desk of our media team um, that we think is not consistent with the values of the company, um, we, don't, we don't take that ad. That answer that more succinctly, Margaret. It did. Um, when you say the values of the company, only because in the past year there have been lots of different companies uh, with different values. <laughs> sure. Yeah. I don't no. Have I mean, to I... say it any more easily, but I'm, I'm concerned <laughs> That's a good point. about things under... being, you know, nonpartisan, and mm -hmm. um, you know, what's offensive to one is not offensive to another. Um, you know, some people, uh, like for instance, the county uh, doesn't like to have Christmas parties, they have holiday parties, okay, because it might be offensive to somebody. What, what values does Volta have that, that, that would yep. uh, influence the kind of thing that was uh, on a sign like that? Sure, no, that's a great question. And I think first, first and foremost, um, there's a dedication to um, to environmental and social good. Um, that's obviously what, what prompted our founder to, to start this when you know, EV adoption was much lower. Um, he saw that as sort of uh, a place that we had to, we had to go as, as a country. Um, and then secondly, um, Scott uh, showed a couple of our ads for Get Out the Vote. Um, so civic engagement, um, but in a nonpartisan fashion. Okay. And do you uh, do anything um, religious? We do not, or we have not. Um, and I believe in this instance, um, there is uh, there is a restriction. Um, I can I can confirm that in the contract. Um, and okay. Get back and, to you all. and political is what I'm thinking about next. Uh, yep. So we don't. Um, we have not to date, and. Um, probably in the future, don't plan to take anything from a particular candidate um, or a particular party. That's, uh, again, you run the risk of offending half the folks. Okay, thank you. Sure. Yeah, and just looking at your website, I don't see anything that talks about no. policy uh, regarding content. It's not there, uh, but that would be something that is a deeper dive into what you guys represent. Yep, so it's um, the restrictions, you know, that's got mentioned, those are standard in all of our contracts. Um, if there are additional things that our site partners are concerned about, um, those are part of the discussion that we have. All right, um, hang tight. I'm gonna move over to Dr. Bundy here and ask him for his question. Uh, thanks, Peter. Um, as uh, uh, you were saying, uh, 
you know, a lot of towns have climate adaptive plans, Port of Madera does, and we're trying to go to uh, net energy zero or net uh, carbon zero. And uh, you've got an impressive uh, CO2 offset with these, with the electrical EV charging, which we need and which we need more of. And it does sound like this is the wild west of EV charging, you know, the way Tesla is doing it, the way Polestar is doing it, uh, the way uh, Volta is doing yeah. it. Right. Uh, but uh, w one of the concerns about uh, having these two centers with uh, a lot of people coming from outside Corte Madera is that that sort of is going to affect our carbon uh, goals uh, to get to carbon neutrality unless uh, both malls uh, start putting a whole lot of photovoltaics on the roofs. Uh, has that been done uh, uh, with Volta uh, anyplace else? Not to my knowledge that we've uh, done photovoltaic on the roof as part of a as part of an EV charging installation. Uh, Bryn, I don't know if you know of anything if that's something you've ever done. That is not something that I've been involved with. No. Yeah, I know it's complicated because you know Volta is just specifically try providing the chargers and the the malls are providing an envelope for various businesses and the photovoltaics are not their core business either. But, you know, what you see is a problem as we go to more and more EVs, which we should be doing. We really need to have more and more clean, renewable energy for these. Otherwise we're, you know, drawing uh, fossil fuels uh, that are uh, running the grid uh, because EVs seem to be, uh, you know, catching on pretty quickly here. So that's, one of my philosophical concerns about, you know, how do we provide the power for all these EV charging stations? Uh, the other uh, uh, question I had was, uh, this is in a FEMA designated uh, flood zone. Uh, and I don't know what uh, the actual uh, th uh, threshold uh, ground level is for where these are going in, but are they designed so that they could withstand uh, you know, a flood at uh, FEMA designated height. Um, I might have to defer to, I don't know, Bryn, do you think uh, our engineering partners would, would know the answer to that question? I know that our stations are, are hurricane proof and they can last up to, I don't know, so many degrees below zero. Um, but as far as floods, I'm not exactly sure. I'll, I'll have to, I'll have to confirm that. Phil? Yeah, I can, I can speak to that, um, Bob. I did talk with Jared, the public works and, and provided him the set of plans. And it is his, his initial take on it. This can easily be um, designed and built to be flood proof. As, as long as the, you know, the unit is built in a way that it can handle the, the two feet or the three feet or whatever the number of feet of water that's going to come in. Um, he is having the, the cord itself higher up on the unit um, to accommodate the flood. So, so Jared was quite um, confident that these could be installed in the floodplain and be installed safely. Good. Thanks, Phil. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so my other question is uh, uh, when looking at these at the village, uh, there was a comment, please limit your time on the charger to no more than two hours. Uh, is this just all voluntary as far as the in enforcement or uh, people doing this? You said it was usually uh, five and a half cars uh, per uh... Oh, Bob, we lost you there. I think I understand the, the question that he's he's asking, should we wait till he unfreezes? Go ahead, if you have, can uh, finish his thought. Yeah, ahead. yeah, so I think what he's referring to is like, how do you control um, folks from, uh, or prevent folks from in the neighborhood going there and um, plugging in at the beginning of the day and then coming back later on in the day. Um, our level two chargers at the village, um, so they offer two hours of free charging and the average charging session for that location specifically ranges from 101 minutes 
uh, per port to 109 minutes per port, depending on which, which charger. We keep track of all the utilization data per, per charger. So we can see over the lifetime, how many charging sessions per, per port uh, and what's the average charging session length. Um, so it comes in right underneath the two hours. So to me, that's a, you know, that's an indication that it's in line with what's available, meaning we likely don't have folks in the neighborhood dropping their car off and leaving it all day. Um, I would also add to that, that the EV community tends to be uh, sort of civic minded and self-policing when it comes to things like that. Um, but more importantly, uh, I think the important thing is what we're about to launch is our check-in process. So historically, Anybody with a plug-in can pull up, they park, they plug in and they can walk away, do their shopping and come back um, when they're done doing their shopping. Um, to prevent certain things like somebody plugging at the beginning of the day and staying all day, uh, we are now requiring a check-in process. So somebody just checks in through the app. Um, and so what that does is that can do a few different things. It can limit the number of charging sessions per week. Um, if we wanted to say, hey, we're only allowing, you know, two unique charging sessions uh, per week uh, per driver. Um, and the reason why we might do something like that is it's geared towards more uh, managing Uber and Lyft drivers that might wanna come and that's their you know, refuel spot. We don't want you know, Lyft drivers and Uber drivers going there every single day and plugging it so we can limit that. The other thing is that we can also incorporate uh, things like a fee um, after a certain free period. And so let's say we're offering two hours of free um, at that two hour mark, then we can start charging a fee to incentivize people to leave, or we can uh, charge a fee once somebody is uh, fully charged to incentivize in the move. Uh, in addition to that, the check-in process will also um, let them know when their time is up and it'll give them push notifications to say, hey, you've got 15 minutes left of your charge, please move. Um, or if their car charges before the end of the free period, or, um, or before the, you know, the two hours with the level two chargers, um, it'll say, hey, your car is charged, um, you know, please move your vehicle. Your car is at 90%, um, move your vehicle. I mean, whatever the messaging is, it'll be nice. It won't say move your vehicle, but <laughs> it'll, that's not my job to come up with that type of lingo. So um, those, are, those are probably the, the most sophisticated ways of uh, managing and preventing people from you know, sitting in their car and, and parking. I'd say the, the other thing from a, a user perspective is that because the charging stations are placed up front near the storefront, uh, most people aren't gonna wanna be seen being that person that sits in their car um, charging their vehicle. Um, and also because it's in the convenient parking spot, um, when they plug in, they're incentivized to you know, go in and get a coffee or go in and do some shopping um, as well, whatever the reason was that they, that they went there. Sorry, that was a long, long response, but I, hopefully I was able to sort of get at the core of, of, of that question. And, and also the five and a half charging uh, sessions per port per day is across the US um, of our network, uh, which includes places like Atlanta and, and Miami and Boston where maybe EV concentration is, isn't as high. California, some of our locations we're seeing 13 charging sessions per day or 10 charging sessions per day. Uh, we see a lot higher utilization in, in California. Do you, do you know what it is at the village? Uh, not off the top of my head, but I can I can take a look. Okay. No, it, it sounds like you're thinking through the uh, process of how do you keep the few people that would take advantage of the situation. So yeah, we we've, uh, we've gotten a lot of feedback from our site partners. <laughs> the the other comment I wanted to uh, to make it appears that the uh, the screens uh, that you're proposing at the uh, town center are smaller than the screens that are at the village. Is that correct? Um, I think Those they're to be six feet high and two feet wide at the village. The screen, the screens, so the screen isn't the entire, uh, uh, you know, charging station. It's just a portion of it. And I think it's about uh, 55 inches, but it's, it's, it's a vertical. Um, we have a, a spec sheet that's in the construction drawings that should um, give the specifications for, for what those dimensions are. Uh, I just I was just making the comment that if people were looking at the village, uh, they the, the screens are different sizes uh, on each side, but one side had a six oh, five screen. And yeah, so the new ones that you're proposing are uh, 
nine square feet as opposed to I think 12 that would be on the uh, village yeah I think I think the ones at the at the village uh one it's a hybrid so one side is a digital and the other side maybe is a is like a paper um paper one that runs the length of the charging station the ones at the town center are are, are the digital and it's dual sided so it's it's just that that portion of the of the of the charging station uh, for the digital piece on the other side so it's not a screen that covers the entire length right yeah yeah thanks for pointing that out uh, yeah those those are old stations those are installed years ago we have and these are these are our brand new our newest models with all the all the bells and whistles okay thank you all right thank, thank you, you dr bundy um on your website it talks about uh dynamic weather or mobile content unlock are these signs meant to be interfacing uh in some way um what what do you mean by interfacing well, i'm asking you know do people come up to it with their cell phone and stand there and interact with the oh th i mean they can um uh, that, I mean, that's that was the the hope that we had when we ran the uh, civic and uh, the civic messaging for for going out and vote and registering to vote um, was having a QR code on there and indicating on the screen to scan it with your phone so you can engage with it. But no, you can't like it's not a touch screen. You can't no. You can't touch it. Yeah. But and it also shows that the content within a screen is can move and is uh, in some way there's motion inside the screen of the advertising yeah Bryn, I, I don't know if you want to speak to to that sure yeah so um we are on the newer models we do have the capability to um to have what is uh referred to as subtle motion um so on if you're looking at the website um you'll see for example um i think there's there's currently one where um, a woman's hair is blowing um and that's just intended to you know raise raise engagement um with the people walking by obviously when before we put dynamic um anything dynamic on the screens we take into consideration where they're located um in most instances um our our stations are located um on a median or or in a little island um so obviously we wouldn't do that in a situation where they were um they were more towards uh a right of way or pardon me a pedestrian walkway for example we don't we certainly don't want it creating safety concerns uh, okay so at this point um what i'd like to do is i'm going to open it up to see if there's anybody who wants to make a public comment on this and then we'll give you a break from the grilling by the commission <laughs> here and then we'll bring it back to you to the commission for more commentary so tracy um do you have any hands up for this uh presentation I don't see any hands raised. Um, uh, no, no open questions in the Q and A, and uh, no, no emails. Okay. Other churches. All right. So for the moment, then we'll close public comment and bring it back um, to the commissioners here to uh, opine and give you some feedback about this. Uh, at this point. Um, we're not going to take any action, but you should hear what we think of this proposal and where uh, we might suggest uh, there be uh, any changes or not. So with that said, um, Mr. Rizzo, do you have any uh, commentary you'd like to provide? Um, just a little bit. I, you know, I, I think um, I think it is a little concerning not knowing that we have any control over the content and it, it would be nice to know if the mall would engage with us a little bit on some of the prescriptive advertising if there's things that the town doesn't want to see on these on the, the digital screens I think that's kind of important to know. Um, uh, the other thing just uh, visually um, it I, I know that you probably were juggling parking spaces for accessibility concerns but if we were to approve two signs it would certainly be nice to have them separated um, across that the, the parking uh, the seven spaces there and I don't know if that ever came up as an option with uh, the landlord or not um, but there's definitely a lot of pedestrian traffic that comes up on the other side where the, the other the accessible parking spaces are. 
So as they come up with their final design, I, I'd like to see them maybe maybe come up with a proposal to split up the signage so that they're all right, not right on top of each other um, if we were going to approve two of them. Um, but other than that, I, 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 all my questions are answered. Um, I'm glad to see that we are getting some more electrical charging um, closer to home. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Jim. Um, Margaret, uh, I'm interested in what you have to say about this. Mm -hmm. I, I just have a real, uh, some real concerns here um, about, first of all, just the look of them. I understand that these charging stations, I don't know, I just, I have to learn more about it, I think, because the image that I kind of have is, is sort of a, this cheap flashing kind of thing going on, which I um, we've really tried hard as far as long as I've been on the commission to be really careful about the signage and the way the signage looks. And at least uh, the time that uh, the village was going to start changing signs, there were was a lot of public uh, sort of uprising about it. And, and I hate to see that happen again um, because this is so much, <clears throat> this is even a more active sort of colorful sign that than what was being proposed at the village. Um, and so that's one concern I have. And the other is still the uh, control of the, um, the content. On the other hand, I realize that these are the kinds of things that need to be encouraged. I'd like to see the town have some profit out of it. <laughs> um, you know, I realize that people are getting this service on, on the basis of the advertising, uh, you know, in exchange for the advertising, people are getting this as a, as a benefit. Um, but I think that something should be worked out so that the town somehow benefits by, uh, by allowing this and also having some uh, control over, as I said before, the content. So I, I guess what I'm saying is I have a lot more to think about. Okay. All right. Phyllis. Okay, I guess I'm gonna be the third one who's gonna bring up the content. I am concerned. I know you've mentioned that you're not going to do it for a candidate or an office holder. And I'm sitting here having nightmare thoughts of something Trump would try to use since he's been banned from Facebook and uh, Twitter. I, I think something else also. I would want to be sure that there's not proselytizing and, and not just religious proselytizing, but proselytizing by some group or individual, I think it's divisive. Uh, also, wondering if um, the signage part, your advertising part, is shut down at night by 11, like we have the lighted signs be shut off at that time, or do you have the advertising going 24 hours a day? And my third question would be, if the signage is shut off at 11, does that mean the charger will not work to charge a car or will it still work to charge a car? So as I said, I'd like answers to those three. Go ahead, Scott, uh, Bryn, go ahead and answer those. those He's questions. thinking about Trump. Oh, I didn't, I didn't know I was allowed to respond. I didn't know I was allowed to respond in this section. I this is an informal <laughs> session, so we don't really have a structure okay. like we normally do for this. So. Uh, Feel okay. Go ahead and answer. Well, that was just just listening to the feedback. Um, the the third I can speak to the third question as far as the uh, getting access to the charging. So uh, we actually have the charger's time, uh, so the charging uh, turns off um, outside of the the store operating hours because we want to prevent folks from um, from loitering in the parking lot. Uh, so the charging the charging is not available um, at that time. Uh, and can you remind me of the the first question? With oh well, let's the, oh, the, the second question. 
relates to the one you just answered, the advertising aspect of it, the lit up advertisement. Does that get shut off too? Uh, I, 11 o'clock is our time that we want the uh, store lights dimmed and et cetera. Bryn, do you want to take this one? Uh, sure. Yeah, in certain circumstances, um, we can uh, we can turn off the screens at night. Um, it's not typical, but uh, they do. They are uh, outfitted with um, an ambient light sensor, so they dim considerably as the as the light goes down. All right, thank you. And uh, I would like the uh, screens to fall under the same rules and regs for the lighted signs that we have in the commercial area. I think it should all be the same. Um, the uh, content, I mean, Jim was concerned, Margaret's concerned, I am concerned. The other two commissioners haven't spoken yet. I'm sure they have concerns also. I really would like to know more about the content. You know, all communities are different and what works in one community is not gonna work in another. And I, I can't think of any examples to give. But, yeah, oh, wait, wait here, let me get something. Uh, marijuana, there are marijuana outlets in uh, different towns and cities around the state and other states. So, they could advertise their business. We do not allow marijuana outlets in Corte Madero. We would not want advertisements on the screen promoting marijuana establishments. Uh, yeah, understood. Um, I, I know that the, the restrictions that we have are um, that we're not allowed to promote illegal drugs, violence, or criminal activity, uh, or anything that promotes the use of weapons or firearms. Um, primary activity or anything that's pornographic in nature, as Bryn said, uh, can't contain profanity or promote strip clubs, gentlemen clubs, or escort services. And we also can't promote anything that is inconsistent with the image of a family-oriented shopping center um, as determined by the, the property owner in its, you know, of course, in its reasonable, reasonable discretion. Okay. Thank you. Can I... Can I ask for clarification, Commissioner Metcalf, on just the, you said the, the lighting or the signage should be similar to what we have in other commercial districts? I'm not sure how no, we would I'm actually... talking about, we say even tonight when with, uh, it was a carbon health. Yep. It says that uh, the, the lighting will be shut off at 11 o'clock. Oh, okay. Or so it's just time, hours. So I'm talking about the time. It... Hours, okay. Yeah, if you know all the lights are dimmed and there are the signs going in their full glory all night. No, no, no. I, I, that's that's work, very clear. That's what okay. we meant. Right. Okay. Thank you. That's why I draw pictures. I better than speaking about it. So I'll just take that opportunity to say that Crate and Barrel does not turn off at eleven o'clock for the umpteenth time. They do not shut down. Um, well, anyway, we should remind them. Doctor Bundy, um, <laughs> would you chime in? Yeah. Um, I just, when you come back uh, with the uh, formal presentation for permit approval, you know, I'd like to know that uh, the engineering is such that it will withstand uh, water up to the FEMA base flood 10, uh, which is, I think, designated for the town center. And also would uh, like to know if the uh, Volta is thinking about how to get uh, more power chargers and the and the ele electrons that you're giving away uh, that we really do need more renewable power sources to go with the EVs that we've got on the road so if there was some corporate thought on that I would like to uh, hear it uh, the the other issue in regard to the content uh, you know this uh, these uh, Volta chargers uh, showed up at Macy's a couple of years ago I don't think anybody really blinked an eye or thought much of it. And uh, maybe Phil, uh, you can say if anybody's lodged any complaint about content or the lighting or just the, the, the sounds showing up in the parking lot. That's all. Phil, has there been any commentary? No, no complaints regarding the charging stations at Macy's. I think I let you know at one point in time that you know, I thought those signs uh, were unusual 
they weren't uh, they should have been brought before us but that was that was going to be a few years ago um, okay so you know capitalism is a wonderful thing and this is a good example of how it can get rolling um, I see where staff has laid out the the juxtaposition of the two different types of sign ordinance that we've got to struggle with here. And we really don't have anything that governs this type of sign at all in place. Um, I think this is going to take an extra effort for staff to start to put something together because we're, we're on the edge of a new uh, type of, I mean, just call it, you know, it's almost something out of the movies at this point where you start seeing this kind of digital content that's blared at us. Um, I'm personally uncomfortable with putting these video screens out there in public to shine out toward the street and so forth, but uh, I think that's another uh, place that our eyes are occupied by digital content. Um, I think that uh, having another place to look at is clearly what the uh, company is after. They want people to look at it. Um, I think it becomes too much. I think that for our town, we need to come up with some real uh, content advisories for this kind of thing because it's a new age. Um, and I'm not quite sure how we're going to do it. You know, the most complicated thing we dealt with is the sign down at the community center with its rotating messaging. And that was quite, uh, shall we say, discussive. Um, <laughs> And um, you guys with Volta think, huh, community sign. Well, you'd be surprised. People were quite upset about that going into it. And so here we are with the next rotating content sign for us to consider. And I think it's really, uh, it's a challenge. So I don't think we're ready to go down that road with the regulations that we have. And I think we have to come up with some more background and some more develop some more uh, governance for this particular issue. Um, I would be uncomfortable accepting it as is in any way, shape, or form right now. Um, I think it's a, it's a bit of a reach given what we have in our toolbox to, to deal with it. Um, the toolbox is not developed. And so I think staff points that out in their report um, that this is a new era and we've got some thinking to do about it and we've got to come up with a new set of standards. So. You know, that's kind of my thought about this. And uh, uh, the digital content is maybe perfectly fine for certain age groups and certain people. They, they see, have no problem looking at it, um, but it's an assault on the senses in a way. Uh, and yet to you guys, I'm sure it's all fine, but the town uh, is not quite ready for it yet, in my opinion. So there you have it. Um, anybody else want to opine further? I see no hand raised. Oh, Phyllis. I concur with all that you've said. I think before the uh, Volta project moves any further along the way that staff is going to have to develop guidelines and uh, standards and ordinance if necessary. So there is this, that parameters are set because this is not going to be the last company that's going to come into town to do things. Yeah. So as I say, I concur with yeah. Peter that we're not quite ready to say, let's go ahead with this project. I, mean, I know we're not voting on it tonight, but to kind of encourage yeah. Volta that we are. I will, I will say um, just in response to that, that um, while it may not have been explicit, you know, um, we did just adopt the EV charging streamlining ordinance back in last summer. And we specifically had a, um, regulation in there that, you know, those um, proposals that met our standards for EV charging, um, and there was an allowance for a certain amount of signage on there, but it was related to the EV charging stations themselves, right. were acceptable under that ordinance and can go straight to building permit. But we explicitly, um, sort of in a nod to some concern about potentially where this could go, um, wanted to make sure that there was a design review process or there was a process associated with signage associated with EV chargers that went beyond sort of the, the, the sort of the identification signage that we thought was appropriate. So it, it's not like we haven't thought about it. Yeah. Um, 
but it, you know, I did, I just wanted to point that out. Um, the revenue stream for electric charging is all over the place. There's many places to find it. Um, and for instance, at uh, the business I work at, we've just had eight charging stations put in that have absolutely no signage on them. And they were put in at no cost to us. So, um, you know, there are, EV, there are EV charging stations available through different revenue streams and it doesn't require signage. Um, it just depends on where you go to get it and who's proposing it. So they have their own revenue stream, they put it in. Um, it, the electricity has to be paid for, um, but we happen to have solar panels on the building. So uh, it, it's, <laughs> it's great. Um, so chargers powered by solar panels. Uh, what more do you want? That's what we do want, actually. So that's what I'd like to see developed. Uh, and it doesn't require uh, uh, video screens to have charging stations. Phyllis. Uh, one more thing for what Adam was saying. If you're going to be adding into the ordinance, you know, some of these other options, I think Volta has done a good job in putting together what the restrictions would be on what they would advertise, but I'd like to see us have the rule itself. Not every company will be as stringent as we would like them to be when it comes to what the content would be. So I'd like some reference to what is not acceptable if there is signage. I'd, I'd like to add something. I, I just, uh, it's sort of bothering me a lot that because Macy's is, is on private property, they basically can put anything they want on private property, even though it faces the pub, it's in the public purview. And they're inviting the public pretty much to plug in and partake of it. and and. And it just got done without any, um, any I don't know, regard at all for uh, the public, uh, any kind of public process. And that, that kind of bothers me. And I know we have an enforcement officer and I don't know what we could enforce at this point, but it's, um, it, it, you know, to me, when something is in a parking lot and you're inviting the public to come and partake in what you're offering, then there ought to be some kind of public regulation about it. And uh, just because the, the property is owned by, uh, by an entity, you know, uh, I don't know what you might call it, you know, it could be called a public nuisance or it could be called a... Um, a, uh, I don't know what, but um, it just bothers me that that went on here. And, uh, and I really think we need to take steps to make sure that that, that doesn't happen again. Mm -hmm. yeah, understood, yeah. And, and, and both that site, the Macy's and this site are both private, private properties. Oh, so private it's, it's, property. Yeah, it's very similar. Yeah. yeah, they just did it. Anyway, it's, I guess the town has to say it's water over the dam, but uh, that's too bad. So, no, not why, necessarily. We don't. Why is it water we, over the dam? Why can't they be fined? Why can't they be forced to apply we, we for hear, a permit? We hear, or the, we, we hear the, the commission's concern about that, and we'll, we'll take okay. We'll follow up with, it, with um, appropriate actions. Thank you. All right, so um, at this point, I would say that we've had a pretty healthy discussion about this issue. Um, and unless somebody has a, a gnawing thought else that they want to express, I'd say that we can let these people go and we can move on. Okay, Scott, Brent, thank you very much. Appreciate thank you. your contribution to this discussion. Yeah, of course, thanks, thanks for your time. Right. Thank you, appreciate your time. Thank you. Bye. Okay, so of the commissioners, uh, whose turn was it to uh, listen in? Mine. To? Okay, Phyllis. Mine. Uh, before I give my report, I just would like to mention one thing. It's a sentence. Uh, if you remember last time, a fellow named David Zach was concerned about, uh, well, he criticized me for supporting 
single family residences. And one of the things he mentioned was how California is growing and we needed more housing. Just as an aside, the census report came out yesterday for the first time since 1900, California has lost population and we lost between January of last year and January of this year, 180,000 the population went down. So I thought it would be something as we look at any development going on, we're not growing. Anyway, back to this business. The main thing in this meeting was the town hall. And uh, you're all aware of the fact that it, after all the work that had been gone through, that a decision was brought before the council on whether or not to raise the original building and have it all be all new construction. So that's what the discussion was all about. And uh, there were a lot of comments made. I think Adam probably wants to go into a lot of this on his reports. So I'm just kind of skim over it. Um, people came in from all different angles, which is interesting. I mean, my own personal concern is the design and the fact that it, it wasn't originally going back to the Planning Commission. At this point, uh, it will come back to the Planning Commission for public input. I thought it was an insult to the public not to do that. But uh, two people, both of them architects, almost wanted to do a new design of the building and move the um, council chambers and everything to the corner where the old building was, which would mean starting again in another three years. So obviously that's not gonna happen. It's, um, people supported the tear down. There wasn't anybody who came out and said, don't tear it down. Peter called in and said, do it, don't do it in stages. I think somebody had talked about rebuilding the whole thing in stages. And let's see, they ended up voting to approve the new building with it coming back to the planning commission for one or two meetings and getting public input, which is mostly going to be the facade and the roof. They're, uh, they're extending the architect's contract, which he certainly deserves. And uh, there was a third thing, and for the life of me, I don't remember it because I didn't write it down. But as I say, pretty much it got a positive reaction as long as it went through process. So that's. I it. think it was the um, to, to go forward with the um, net carbon neutral um, environmental sustainability measures, but not going with the UFAD um, right. system at this point in time. But um, Todd sent me something. I had requested what the costs were when it was $9 million saving that the old building and 10.6, what was the difference? And I thought what you said when I listened to the meeting that going into those environmental things was raising the price. I was thinking that was 600,000 of the one six. That was in the 900,000, according to this chart put together by RJ. As a matter of fact, I sent a copy of it to you too, Peter, in an email where he broke down the price. And I think I'm sure I sent it to you too, Adam. So um, it's, they're not going ahead, you're correct. The IJ article is incorrect about including that under the floor. Right. Uh, but it will be carbon neutral plus, um, there was excess something, what was the 400,000? One was, was gonna cost a 2,000 and one was gonna be additional 400. Oh, well you start with, it's sort of like you start with the um, zero net energy. Yeah. And then you build on top of that the right. net carbon neutral, um, no fossil fuel fuels used in right. uh, The thought was that if things go smoothly, ground could be broken probably next spring. 
anything yes. else? Adam? Peter, no, I, th I, I think that's right. And I, I appreciate um, Commissioner Metcalf's comments um, at the meeting and even before the meeting uh, when I spoke to her. Uh, so I think what we're planning to do um, is to um, come back to the Planning Commission at the next meeting for public, basically to continue to have a public conversation, uh, invite public input, hear from the commissioners as well about, primarily really about, um, you know, as we looked at this, we, we saw really the, the support that we all had and, and that everybody that we talked to had about the organizing feature really was that plaza level we're not, we don't feel there's a need to change or relook at that as sort of the um, organizing element off of Tamil Pius. And so we're, we're, we're keeping the program really as is or as was proposed. We're just replacing the, the building that's currently there with a new building. And actually what that allows us to do is shrink the footprint in the floor area of the lower level because we actually, that was mostly going to be unused space and storage and sort of we we're trying to fill it up with stuff because it was during the remodel and we won't build back a full floor plate on the lower level just because it's not needed and the expense and cost uh, once it becomes floor floor area of additional costs and so it's just it was the building actually shrinks in terms of floor area by almost a like 900 square feet or so forth um and that's uh was an important factor in sort of the overall um assessment of whether to, um, for, from a cost standpoint of going with a, a, a completely new building. So um, in essence, we have the same four walls and we'll get into this at the next meeting, but just in describing what we talked about at the last meeting, it's, we, we also think we can even pinch a little bit um, of the footprint um, off of, of the width of the building, um, have the very, uh, similar floor plan to what we had showed you previously on that upper level. Uh, and then now, obviously, we have the opportunity, though, with the new building to really look at um, integrating, uh, sort of using a more um, unified design um, for the entire building, uh, rather than before what we were using was a sort of a, a mix of designs. However, you know, that that's what, that's sort of what staff is looking at and, and Ron Cappy is sort of looking at how to make this more of a unified building and from a, in a cohesive design. Um, but we still obviously have the design from a, with a flat roof that we showed previously and that people ultimately came around to. So I think we're gonna, we're gonna be working on a, uh, something that has more of a pitched roof feature. Um, and sort of, you know, something that is more cohesive in nature, um, holistic. Um, but that's really the conversation we want to come and talk to the commission about and get really public input on as well in terms of the roof design of the new building uh, and the windows and the fenestrations and the facade and how that looks. The other thing that we, the feature that we will, um, we, we presented will not be um, rebuilt is currently we have that exterior stairwell that sort of sticks out and there's an appendage on the north elevation uh, that can be moved to the interior of the building. So it's more of a, of a, a sort of a clean line around the back, which has some uh, adjustments, allows some adjustments to the um, circulation. And the other thing to note, we, we previously had to ramp, we had some grade differences between the remodeled building and the uh, new building, which now can all be at the same level at the lower level, you know, so we're not dealing with grade changes at the lower level. Okay. Okay. May I ask something of Adam, please? Sure. Adam, I've been looking through all of the drawings we've had on this building, the other different sets. And one of the things that Ron Capio, I think does some very nice work, by the way, uh, he gave us some options. He had drawings that showed options. And I would hope that when he comes back, we could have some options on different ideas that could be done for the roof. You know, 
because it's oh. really mostly the roof and it's not like he has to redesign the whole building and you know the interior and stuff but it, is it a flat roof is it going to be peaked is it going to be as high a peak as the other you know a couple of things to look at we have the two we, i think we do have the two options we have the flat roof which was previously considered and would likely be a little bit higher in, in height yeah uh, and then we have a new we're going to come with a new uh, sort of pitched roof design as well and so those okay. are the options that we're we're working on. This is obviously this is coming up two weeks. So we we have a staff report and the materials are being put together yes. as we speak, and we'll be prepared for Wednesday. And then so just so you know the the full process. So we want to have this meeting. We really hope we get some input on and 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 uh, and then we can go back to the town council. I think uh, in June, we do need to sort of wrap up some of the. Um, you know, just for sake of keeping the momentum of the project and meeting some of the, 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 the deadlines that RJ has for putting this project out to bid, and he described this at the meeting on Tuesday night as well, um, that uh, we, we want to get into um, uh, enough work with the construction level drawings or um, bid drawings um, to go out, I think, in December. And so that puts us in, a, in the need to sort of move forward. There were some questions. I, I think there was some input at the Tuesday meeting about how to design that contract. And that's under consideration, I know, at Public Works and will be discussed with Todd and, and Public Works about how best to, to do that. Um, the so. bid contract, you mean? Yes, yes, exactly. Yeah. Um, I, I mean, I suggested doing having a separate contingency fund be it, because it's to. better to come in lower than it was bid than come higher. Adam, I think there was also some discussion on where the staff would be during construction. Yes, that's right. And that was a additional uh, cost, obviously, right. as well. But we're, yeah, and so staff, um, if according to the schedule, we move forward in this manner, um, we're looking at also early, maybe end of the year, early next year, um, logistically moving staff. Um, to uh, portable um, trailers or what have you, and, and the location yet to be determined, but we're sort of looking Pixley area, uh, that park area on, you know, uh, at, in that look, sort of that uh, across from the fire station or, you know, somewhere over there that's not too far away from our existing location and still connected to the public works uh, trailer and so forth. So big changes. The other, um, uh, I can mention this at the next meeting, but I know we're gonna have a sort of a, a pack next meeting. We also are working on one thing just to note, um, a, a new permit tracking system, um, implementing that on June 21st, which I think will be a real, I'm, I'm crossing my fingers and I'm hopeful that it's a real game changer in terms of how we interact with the public, how much information we are able to put out there to people in terms of just permits that have been applied for uh, and also where permits are in the process. Um, there's a lot of work to be done to get all of our staff up to speed and trained and then switching all of our data to this new tracking system and then ultimately getting um, the public aware of how they now need to or, or can submit applications and get information on the status of their building permits, planning applications, public works, works permits, et cetera. So it's gonna be a real um, exciting year um, and, and a lot of one of, with a lot of changes, I think, for um, the department. That's the Excella system for- It uh, is. Yeah. yeah. Okay. I think, uh, um, I'm not sure if <laughs> you probably use that. I don't know. Yeah. I, I, I think Berkeley has it. Um, Similar features and Palo Alto. Yeah. Oh no, Palo Alto. <laughs> Bob, you have a, something you want to bring yeah, up? Just wanted to get an understanding of the goal of trying to go to uh, uh, net carbon zero. Uh, obviously, if you can eliminate your forced air furnace with a heat pump, and then the only other source of fossil fuel would be hot water heating uh, that would either go to electricity or I think a heat pump that they have on those, it, it, 
those are those would be the only two sources of fossil fuel that would be in a building like that, right? Right, that's correct. Yeah, it, yeah, and I think and there, the main, there was discussion around that at the meeting on Tuesday, and 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 how impactful that would really be. Um, but I think there was a there was sort of a conversation about this is the future of where the town wants to lead in this regard. Um, and it's a important, it's important from a, I think a physical standpoint, but also from a statement standpoint of what we wanna say about um, our town facility um, that was, you know, the town would be um, spending obviously a considerable amount of um, money on. So, um, but yeah, I, I hear you. And, and actually, you know, RJ and, and the team, they have more, they, we did a, produce a report um, that's been in the staff reports before um, regarding sort of the, these different options um, that I think was in, Phil, we've had that in the, well, back before when we came to the planning commission, right in November, or was that produced after November of 2020 when we went to the town council in February? No, we yeah we had the we had the energy study in the fall fall of last year. I think, yeah, I think so. I, it might have because I, I remember I think the commission had asked for more. Yeah, we may have anyways, but we can we can provide that report where a lot of that information came from. If that's helpful. Thanks. Okay. Anything else on the council meeting that took place? No. Um, there is a. Um, interim parks and rec director um, um, as Ashley is is uh, due for her second child and so that's um, she'll be out for a couple of months or a few months um, so that's just be aware of that and I think that was discussed at the meeting as well well they're adding another position in that and adding another position that's right hmm. okay I couldn't figure out why all that was going on all right, so now it's clear. All right, with that said, uh, we have the town hall mod modifications for the next agenda, which will be the 18th. I'm sorry, the 25th. That's when our next meeting will be, and that's when you're going to present this. And there were uh, story polls up on town hall. Correct. And, and, They've been up for quite a while. We have some pictures of them. We are going to be removing them, um, you know, uh, just because they've been up for so long that it's impacting the sort of the ability to use the lot, obviously, um, and circulation through the lot. But um, I think we've really mostly what was similar, mostly the only thing that changed really was you see now a little peak over the existing town hall structure. Um, and so uh, the usefulness of them as well, I think, is, um, is not as, as significant at this point. And we, we'll, we'll take, we have a bunch of photos we can use as well for that purpose if need be. Okay. What kind of advertising are you gonna do to get community input? Are we gonna have some kind of... It's already <laughs> started. Yeah, we're gonna do the big glass, um, this goes out this Friday. We have the email list. So I think we've had really pretty solid um, uh, attendance and, and it has, um, you know, it's got a lot of input over the last couple of years. And I think um, part of that is we've collected all the emails um, from people who have made any comment in the past. We're gonna, so we'll use that email list. We'll use all our, the newsletter, we didn't have a community chat today. It was canceled for the AB one, two, three, four, five uh, training. So we won't have another, well, actually we will right before the meeting in two weeks, we'll have another opportunity in the community chat. Um, so we wide, we'll do it as wide as possible. Um, use the sign in front of the, the community yep. center. Use yeah. the sign, use the voting stations at yeah. Macy. No, I'm just joking. Um, Video screens at the gas station. Video screens. <laughs> screens <at the> <laughs> <laughs> it was um, a good turnout. It, I mean, the number of comments that were made at the council meeting last week yeah, it was, shows there were a lot good. of people were interested. And uh, I guess uh, Rebecca, we could ask Rebecca because she has keeps track of how many, you know, you have to give your email, how many people sign up 
for the meeting. So there are a lot of people who didn't talk who were listening. We ought to get yep. a number from her. And then is it okay to switch topics real quick? Yes. Just on another report. I, I wanted to turn it over to Martha um, just to, I think, strictly as a report, um, just but just information. I don't want to really, we can't really get into a discussion here, obviously, during this part of the agenda, but just to inform you of a sort of an instructive um, application we received recently about uh, accessory dwelling units that I think is, is informative. And, and if you have more questions, we can follow up offline with any of you uh, as you as you wish. Good yeah, good evening, everyone. Um, so as Adam mentioned, we got a, a recent ADU application. It's for a building permit for two uh, detached accessory dwelling units. And this is a little unusual in that it's the, the first building permit we've had for ADUs on a parcel developed with a multifamily. Um, so state law allows, if there's a, an existing multifamily building and it's zoned for multifamily, you can have two detached ADUs. And the ADUs are limited to a maximum size of 800 square feet and then a maximum height of 16 feet. And then in addition to that, you can also create ADUs within existing spaces. And that's based on the number of existing multifamily dwelling units. So this is being reviewed by staff as a building permit application, which is consistent with our, our ordinance. And we're obviously reviewing the different objective standards to make sure it conforms. Um, but we just want to make it make you aware of it since it's kind of the, the first ADU on a multifamily property we've had. And then obviously, if anyone has any questions, you know, I'm happy to, to discuss. You can uh, reach out to me and look at the plans. Or It's over them. on, and, and the location is near? It's 5491 Paradise Drive. So it's on the corner of uh, Paradise and El Camino. And it's currently developed with, uh, there's three multifamily units in a, a single building. And it's about, it's about a, a 15,000 square foot parcel and it's zoned um, R2. Yeah. It's, an, it's a very unusual location and lot. Um, but anyways, thought it would be informative just to bring that to your attention. Please, you know, it's, it's we're seeing sort of um, uh, developers and, or I won't even call them developers, but people who are interested in land development sort of gain more and more knowledge about the different um, laws uh, that have been developed at state and then also just our own ordinance as well. So I think, you know, it's, it's one to keep track of and we can talk about it um, as it uh, what makes its way through the process, but let us know if you have any questions about that. So that's across the street from Aegis? Exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and another thing we've noticed recently is we're getting a lot more questions and we've had several applications on JADUs um, of garages being converted into JADUs. I think we're up to, to two or three that have been submitted in the last couple of weeks. So there's definitely a lot more kind of interest and a lot more people are kind of learning about the ADU, ADU rules and regulations. And you know, we definitely get a lot of questions um, from the mm -hmm. community. Um, if there's a, uh, this is a strictly ADU question, I hope it's okay. Um, if there's a large front yard, can uh, ADU go in the front yard? It cannot. So the, the state law um, allows them in the rear yard and they need to maintain the mi uh, minimum four foot rear yard and four foot side yard setback, but they are not al allowed in the front yard. Okay. Somebody asked me that the other day. Yeah. All right. Okay. Uh-oh, here we go. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> The house that's at, I think, one Harbor Drive has an ADU in the front yard. Uh, was that, or, or was that, it, it uh, goes on, side. or it's at the corner of Harbor and Paradise. Yeah, it was a converted garage, right? That was the one. I, yeah. I can't remember, yeah. Yeah, it's a converted garage. And so that that's also a permitted, you can convert into an existing structure, oh. frankly, no matter where it is. Okay. And I think that, that's, that's also sort of one of those corner lots, I think. But anyways, um, okay. ADU, uh, ADU uh, we'll do an ADU night uh, in the future and we can all share all our stories. We have ADUs. to. Yeah. <laughs> I don't <laughs> know right. if my blood pressure can take it. <laughs> oh no. All right. All right, yeah. That's so with that said, um, we have some minutes to approve for the meeting of April 27th. Mm -hmm. Oh, it, it will be reviewed on May 25th. We don't have right. it. We don't have any minutes. Okay. 
with that said, I think that we've done a fine job here tonight. And I think our work is done. So <laughs> good night, everybody. Thanks good night. so much. Thank everybody. you, Peter. Good night. Good night, good night. everybody.